How you doing today? We had, we had spring break this last week, which means our kids had a great time and parents need a vacation, don't you? <laughs> oh man, I love, I love Easter. You love Easter too? I'm dropping stuff. I love the energy of Easter. I love the celebration of Easter. I love what the resurrection means. It means that, that Jesus indeed was everything he claimed to be. He, in fact, is, is not just claiming to be God, but he is God himself. And by his resurrection, he's given us resurrection as well. And that's not just for the life to come, but that is also for this life. Now, it's really funny. You here this morning are all responsible for ruining my opening sermon illustration. And the reason for that is, you know, <laughs> I, have a con- I was going to make a confession to you, but this year is just different. I, I feel like... Every single year, I have to prepare myself for the Sunday after Easter. Because every, there's, there's, and there's a couple reasons for that, right? Usually from the Sunday of Easter to the next Sunday, we experience a 50% drop in attendance. Happened last year. It's absolutely true. And, 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 and so with a drop of 50%, there's also a huge drop of energy and there's a lot more holes in the chairs, right? And so I need to put chairs up and spread chairs out so it doesn't feel so sparse around here. And I have to emotionally prepare myself for the fact that there's going to be a lot less people. But you're all here this morning. <laughs> and you're praising God this morning. And so I was going to use that as an illustration to talk about the different seasons of life that we have, and you all blew that. So um, we're just going to jump right into how I was going to start the message without that transition. And you can just thank yourselves that you threw me off my game this morning. So what I want to do, though, is just recognize this, right? With Easter and, and, and with, all, well, with all things of life, you know, Easter, our lives are really a collection of different seasons, Right? There's a time for Easter, there's a time for celebration and praise and joy, but there's also times uh, when we're in the desert, in the valley. And it'd be nice if every Sunday felt like Easter, but that's not the way that God made it. Sometimes, because I wanted to show off my artistic skills, I drew pictures for you this morning to help you think about the different seasons of life, and and you can maybe relate to one, right? I I actually have nine, so you can kind of wait for the one that really relates to you. Um, Here we go. So sometimes, it's like you're on the mountain, right? This is the Easter experience. You're praising God. Everything's going great. You've been more than a conqueror in Christ, and so you're on the mountain. Sometimes you're in the valley, and there's just, you're, you're in the valley of the shadow of death. You're in a place of despair, right? Sometimes you're in the forest, and, you're, and you just, there's so many trees, you just can't seem to, you can't see out of the forest, You know, maybe you just feel like, I can't see what's coming next, and so you're confused and a little lost. Sometimes it's like we're in the desert. Could you tell that was the desert? That's a cactus. Um, (laughs) Now you're like, I get it. It's a cactus. And sometimes, you know, we're thirsty and we're hungry, and we're in seasons of life where we just feel like there's got to be something more for me. Sometimes, (laughs) sometimes you're just enjoying the blessings of life. God has been good and you're in a positive season and you're like, all I can do right now is rejoice because of the goodness of God. Sometimes it's like you're just, you're on a long hike and you're just hiking uphill. You've been doing it for a long time and you just know you have this for whatever, you've just been working hard in the same direction for a long time. You just have to persevere. Maybe you feel like you're in that stage of life right now. If you're a parent with children, you probably feel that way right now. Sometimes... (laughs) You just feel like life is out of control, and you lose your footing, and you feel like you're falling downhill. Sometimes you feel persecuted. The guy on the left is not breathing fire. The guy on the left is shouting words of persecution. The guy on the right is delivering a karate kick of persecution. But sometimes you just, you feel like you're under attack. Uh, Sometimes you deserve it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes we stand up for our faith, and we seek to do the right thing, and we find ourselves under attack. Sometimes we know that we're getting towards the end of our lives. Maybe a, maybe a cancer diagnosis or something like that, and we just know that we're in the last season of our life before we go home to be with the Lord. So here's the nine seasons that I have. You can probably come up with more. Look at that. What season do you feel like you're in right now? Now, here's the thing. It's not bad to be in one particular season of life versus another. 
because that's the way God made life, right? Um, and I know that sometimes there's a temptation if I may be like, if I'm in the middle season where I'm jumping, I feel like, well, that's, that's the good season. That's the season where I feel God's presence, where he's really at work in my life. But that's not how God works. God is at work in every one of these seasons. We just don't always recognize it. I was uh, weird at we just finished a couple weeks ago a season of prayer, and a group of us were meeting Wednesday evenings to pray. And I had actually been, had a meeting earlier that day. I was praying with another pastor, Pastor Arnold from La Roca Covenant Church. And we had, we'd prayed together, and it, it was just this moment where I felt like God really met us, and, and we could feel his presence together as we were praying. And I was sharing that at the prayer group, and then uh, one, of the, one of the guys next to me, he goes, you know, sometimes though, you know, prayer doesn't always feel like that. Sometimes prayer feels like a struggle. Sometimes you don't always have, feel like you have all the words, and you have to work at it. And he's like, and I think God's just as much in that time as he is when you can feel him. I said, you are absolutely right. God is present in all of these different seasons. Now, what I want us to do a second, and we're going to talk more about these seasons, is I want us to think now about Easter and the disciples, right? The disciples have just seen their rabbi, their Messiah, come back to life. So if you're just following Easter, they've just discovered Jesus is alive, what season are they in? Could be two of them, right? I mean, they're on the mountaintop. Their Messiah conquered right? This is a good day. They're, they, are, they are living it up right now. There's hope. There's life. And they probably feel like the guy in the middle too. Every, like there's blessing. This is just an awesome season of life. But you know, Jesus knew though that they were going to be up on the mountaintop forever. Because in not too long, Jesus is going back up to heaven and they will no longer be with him. And Jesus knows that over the course of their lifetime, they're going to hit every single one of these seasons. And so before he goes, he wants to spend some time with them and give them some tools. Well, first of all, he wants to teach them and and tell them, hey, when I'm gone, there's a purpose for your life. And he's going to talk to them about what he wants them to do when he ascends into heaven. But the other thing he's going to do is he's going to show them where to look for him after he goes. Because if they know where to look for him in the right places, they're going to be able to thrive in each one of these seasons. Right? No matter whether you're in the best one or you feel like you're tumbling. And so let's jump in. One day, Jesus tells his 11 disciples, he says, I want you to go ahead of me and I want you to go to a mountain and wait for me there. And on the mountain, this is what happens. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this is a very famous passage. If you've been in church for any amount of time, you've heard this probably uh, either preached or you've heard a lot about it. Uh, what do we call this? What's the name of this passage? We call it the Great Commission, right? These are like the marching orders from Jesus. Now, of course, very obviously, we typically look at this passage for um, his direction in terms of how we're supposed to live and what the church is about. But let me just ask you a question, simple question. What is it Jesus is asking us to do. Talk to me. Obey him. Good. What's he ask? What else? Make disciples. Trusting him. What do we do to disciples as we make them? We baptize them, right? So, so Jesus basically, so there's, there's, there's two main, as I look at this, there's two main kind of jobs that he gives us. Number one is it's our job to introduce people to Christ. It's our job to bring the gospel to people. And when people's hearts respond to the good news of Jesus, we baptize them. And the reason we baptize, it's a a spiritual experience. It's It's also a symbolic experience. When you go under the water, it signifies the death to our old self, 
And when we come out, it represents new life in Jesus Christ. And it's a declaration to all that I belong to Jesus. And if you have made a profession of faith to Jesus, the next step for you to be is baptized. If you need to be baptized, please come talk to us. We would love to baptize you here. So the first part, though, we help people come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the second thing is, is we're supposed to help them become disciples, right? Now, does anyone know what a disciple is? A follower, right? Now, very specifically in the context that this happened is in, is in Jerusalem, or excuse me, in Israel, they had kind of this system where there would be rabbis. Rabbis would be famous teachers who had authority, who had a specific kind of teaching, and Jesus was a rabbi. A rabbi would choose a group of followers, and those followers, his 12 disciples, would follow him wherever he went. And their goal was not only to learn everything that he had to say, their life goal was to literally become like Jesus. So when we say it's our job to make disciples, we're saying it's our job to help everyone, including myself, become as much like Jesus as possible. So I wrote this up here. This is a very messy way to say it, but I just thought it sounded great. Our job is to help as many people as possible become as much like Jesus as possible, including ourselves. See, the Great Commission, I know there's a movement in the church that's been more of a modern one, and it's important to have vision and mission. Those things are very important, right? But there's no question what the mission of the church is, no matter if you're here or the church across the street. We all share this one very common mission. Now, As a church, we have a strategy for this. Or at least I should say we have a half strategy of this. And the other half we're working on. How many of you, raise your hand if you have have an oikos. Raise your hand if you have an oikos. Okay. Basically, as a church, we said, you know, we have a responsibility to influence the people around us for Jesus Christ. And it is our job to be instruments of grace to the people he's put around us. And that means we, we pray for them, we think about them, we serve them in love. And if you have an oikos, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't have one and you want to be a part of the mission of Jesus in this church, in the lobby you can find information. Um, there's nothing special about it. It's just the things that Jesus told us to do and we made a list for you so that you know how to reach lost people. The second part though, and maybe the part that we're working on as a church, is how do we become better at making disciples? How do we do a better job of helping people, helping ourselves and helping people around us become more like Jesus? Now, if you want to be a part of that conversation as we explore this further, I would encourage you, it's in your bulletin, there's information out there, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're starting our Vitality Huddles as a church. In the very first session, we're going to talk about spiritual conversations. And as a community, how do we take the relationships God has given us And how do we use those relationships to make disciples? How do we talk to one another? How can we be bold? And what type of questions can we ask? And so if you want to learn and get better at how to make disciples, please show up at the Vitality Workshop, sign up in the back, and you have a great time. But today, I'm not so interested in talking about how to make disciples, but I'm more interested in talking about the gift that Jesus gives. Because behind this great commission is a wonderful promise from Jesus that's going to give his disciples everything they need to get through the seasons that are coming up. Now to do that, I want to give you, I want to give you an image. So I think sometimes an image is helpful to remember what the sermon was about. Take out your right hand. Now, the right hand has a specific role in scripture. The right hand is the body part that signifies active presence, right? So you look at that, and you think about this. If you're going to write someone a letter, you're not going to use your left hand, you'll use your right hand, unless unless you're left-handed and you're a freak, but I assume none of you are freaks, and (laughs) I'm so joking. Who's left-handed? Where's my left-handed people in the house? Amen. Man, you guys are the cool people. All right, so If you're left-handed, just pretend you're right-handed for the sake of the illustration. It'll all work out, okay? Um, 
the right hand is, is, is the active part of your body. When you want to write a good letter, right, you use your right hand. When you want to do something skillfully, you use your right hand. If you want to throw a baseball, you use your right hand. I cannot throw with my left hand, right? I throw worse than my son with his right hand with my left hand. The right hand signifies the active presence. Now, I'm going to have you do something now. And, and, this, and this is just your memory tool. There's nothing magical about this. I want you to take your right hand, and I want you to put it up to, up to heaven, okay? And uh, when we ask the question, where is Jesus? Let me put here, hold your hand up. Don't get tired. This is your workout this morning. Um, where do we find Jesus? First, we find Jesus at the right hand of the Father. So reach up to heaven. Now you can take it down, shake out, shake out your workout. Okay. The next place that we find Jesus is extending his right hand. I'll talk about that. Put your hand out, right? You find him extending his right hand. Last but not least, you'll find Jesus at our right hand. So maybe just take your left hand and cover your right hand. Up, out, and right beside us. Now, let's kind of go through each piece a second. Let's talk about the uh, Jesus is the right hand of the Father. I want to show you a handful of scriptures so you can see I'm not making this up. Here we go. Matthew chapter 26, 64. This is when Jesus is being basically interviewed by the chief priest, and they're looking for a reason to kill him. This is what Jesus says when they ask him if he's the Messiah. Jesus says, you have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the disciples and the other scripture readers talked a lot about this. I'll give you a couple more examples. In Acts 2.33, this is actually, this is the first sermon after a time called Pentecost when God poured out his spirit on the people of God. It says, Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. He was received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and here. Last but not least, in the book of Ephesians, Paul writes, the Father raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So do you know what it means to be at the right hand? What's that? Be in the presence, that's a part of it, right? At the time when this was written, back in the day, you'd have rulers And those rulers would have thrones. And it was said that full authority and full power were exercised at the right hand. And so when they said Jesus is exalted to the right hand, what they're saying and what Jesus said is that Jesus now has full authority and power over everything. Absolutely everything. Right, there's, think about this, right? There's different, there's different maybe thrones or places of power in our world, but the people in power only have authority over the sphere that they have, right? Our president has authority over America, right? The principal has authority over the school. And here the writers say, Jesus has authority over everything, The breath you just breathed was only because he let you take it. Can you believe that? The sun only comes up at the command of Jesus Christ. Amen? There is nothing that passes, whether good or evil, without Jesus letting it pass. I know that raises all sorts of questions that aren't for this sermon But you have to understand, when Jesus is in authority, he has the power to do anything. He has the power to determine your destiny, whether you will spend eternity in heaven or in hell. That is his authority over life, over death itself. Now, let's go back to the here. Jesus gives us the Great Commission. But what's the reason he gives so that we should do the Great Commission? Or if I should phrase that differently, why should we do the Great Commission? Because of what? Why, why should we do the Great Commission? 
because all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Because of that fact, therefore, go and make disciples. I want you to think about authority and how it works for a second, right? Here's a couple examples. Some of you here are contractors, and there's a particular authority that you have to work with, either a city or the state or the county or something like that. And that authority has a special set of rules to follow. If you're going to build a home, you need to have this threshold, this many feet, and all these, all these things, right? And if you're a contractor in building, you're going to follow the rules set by the authority. Because if you don't follow the rules, they're going to rip it, make you rip it down and do it over again, right? And if you're a contractor, because you know there's an authority, you're going to spend your time and your energy learning what the rules are and what's expected of you because that's the authority, right? Or perhaps maybe some of you have, well, I don't know, maybe some of you have a doctorate here, or you are working towards a doctorate, and you know that basically to get your PhD, typically you have to write your dissertation, your great research paper, right? Well, when you write your paper, there's a professor that is in charge of you, and they help guide you and tell you what you're going to write about. And if they tell you, hey, you're going to write about this, Are you going to go over here and say, no, I'm going to write about this? No, that's crazy, right? Because they have the authority to pass or to fail you. Or let's say you get pulled over and you look suspicious and the police officer tells you to get out of the car and the police officer has his gun drawn, right? I hope that would never happen to you here. But when that police officer says, put your hands up, what are you going to do? You're putting your hands up. You're going to put them on the car. You'll do exactly what the police officer asks you to do because the police officer has the authority over you, right? Now, think about how important earthly authority is to us. We respond to earthly authority. But sometimes I wonder in our lives, if we take God's authority seriously, right? Jesus, who has all authority on heaven and earth, gave us all a very specific call and direction in our lives. This is what he told us to do while he waits for us on the other side. Do we take this as seriously as all the other authorities in our lives? Sometimes I wonder if we don't. So why should we make disciples of all nations? Because the one who sits on the throne of the universe has commanded us to make disciples. Now, the thing about Jesus, though, he sits on the throne, but he's not heavy-handed, right? When he asks us to do stuff, he always fills his commands with lots of hope and lots of love because that's the type of ruler that he is. When I talk, think about the fact that Jesus is at the right hand of God, I find a lot of hope in that. Because as I go out and do my best to try to make disciples and to spread his name, even when I fall on my face, even when I'm not quite doing it the right way, and even when I am, I trust this. Because Jesus wants disciples to be made, guess what? It's all going to end up good. You know? And even though I might look silly doing it, even though I might lose some friends trying to make disciples, at the end of the day, I get to stand before him. And I know that he's the one who holds my life in his hands. And because of that, I can live and make disciples with a death-defying confidence. Now, let's go to the next point, right? Jesus is the right hand of the Father. Jesus is also extending his hand. Now, or his right hand, I should say. There's a particular image in Scripture um, you can find in the Old Testament. It's really kind of a neat thing. Um... When the family blessing and the family authority and even the lion's share of the family property was passed down, it would be passed down by the father taking his right hand and placing it upon his usually firstborn son, but not always. And when the father placed his hand upon the son, he would give him the authority of the family He would give him the blessing of the family. And in doing so, the father would essentially put his name and his reputation and his well-being on this particular child. 
when we look at the life of Jesus and we look at the places that he was, do you know where he was most of the time? He was with people who needed a savior. He was with people who needed a healer. Because Jesus was all about mission. And Jesus would come and place his hands on people to extend his blessing, to extend his love. Where do we find Jesus? We will find Jesus when we're doing mission. You know, I love, we have a great worship team. Of course, a lot of them are gone today. And it's so good to be together, and sometimes we feel the presence of God together. But I got to tell you this. If your life is not involved in reaching your hand out with Jesus, what you experience here is not real. Maybe that sounds too bold on most. In the book of Isaiah, one time, uh, God says to these people, say, listen, you, you raise your hands and you have these great worship experiences, but you don't take care of the people around you. You're not doing the things that I ask you to do in the world that I have placed you. And because of that, all these great worship experiences are meaningless because you're not extending your hands. And I love what happens here. I love this image, right? Uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's a very powerful line. See, in the Bible, um, when it talks about the name of someone, it really talks about their intimate presence. And in the Old Testament, when God established his temple, he said to his people, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my name on that temple. In other words, my presence, my reputation, and my glory will all be here on this temple. And every time someone responds to the hand of God, Jesus says they receive my name. So if you want to know where you can find the presence of Jesus, he's at the right hand of God, but every time we are spreading the good news of the gospel, every time the hand is extended, we're experiencing his presence. Now last but not least, let's go to the last one. It says that Jesus is at our right hand, right? He says that I will be, I, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age When the psalmist wrote about the presence of God, look how they talked about it. This is cool. Oh, shoot. Wrong scripture. Here we go. It says, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you do not fear for I am with you there's a there's a poem most of you probably know it but it's exactly what came to my mind when I was thinking about this part of of where is Jesus the poem footprints and the one who writes that poem Basically, he looks back at his life like he's walking across the sand and there's two sets of footprints, but he notices whenever there was a hard place in life, a discouraging place, instead of seeing two sets of footprints, he only saw one, that's right. And in, in, in one set of footprints were the footprints of Jesus and, and one were his. And so he looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, why is it that whenever life got really hard, you left me? And Jesus turns around to him and says, what? He's like, no, I never left you. I was carrying you. I was holding you close. We were actually, when we were going through the hard times together, I was actually closer to you than you even recognized. Amen. And I love that because that's the truth. That's the promise of Jesus when we become his children. Never will he leave you. Never will he forsake you. Jesus loves to be close to you. And he promises to do exactly that. So, here's the seasons again, right? You know what picture you said represented your life. If you want to truly thrive, I believe that if you can keep your eyes on those three places, no matter where you are, you can get through it, right? 
Jesus is where? At our, he's at the right hand of the Father. He's extending his right hand. And Jesus is at our right hand. And I thought that'd make a good triangle, so I made a triangle for you. <laughs> Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's extending his right hand. And he is at our right hand. But I was thinking as we, in this life, Jesus is ascended to heaven, it's really important that we keep our eyes on all three parts of the triangle, right? Because if you lose sight of any one of those places, it's not good, right? If you, if you forget that Jesus is the right hand of God, eventually you're going to lose hope because you won't be able to make sense of this world and you're going to think that Jesus is not in control of it, right? So you'll lose hope if you forget where he is. If you forget that Jesus is out there extending his right hand, eventually you're going to lose purpose in your life. Or another way you can talk about losing purpose is losing faith, right? Because God has us here for a purpose, and if you, keep your, if you don't look to him as the Jesus who reaches his hand, you'll lose your purpose in life. And if you forget the fact that Jesus is right here next to you holding your right hand, you know what you're going to lose? You're going to lose love. You will lose love if you forget that he's right next to you because any love that we could possibly have is the love that he gives us. And there's a scripture, faith, hope, and love. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. He's talking about the future. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. These are the things that Jesus points us to. Because if we keep our eyes on him, he can take us through any season. And no season is to ever be without hope because Jesus is in control. So with that, let's pray and we'll continue to worship. Jesus, thank you that you're in control. Thank you that you're at the right hand of the Father. Thank you that you are active in mission in this world. Thank you, Jesus, that you are right at our right hands. And God, as we've been living this life, I know for me, I'm not always putting my attention in the right place. So Jesus, I pray for all of us that you would help us to see clearly where you are. And Jesus, as we look to you, we pray that you would give us faith. We pray that you give us hope. We pray that you would give us love. Jesus, we pray that we would be disciple makers because, Lord, that's what you want us to do. And someday we're going to see you face to face and we're going to wish we made as many disciples as we possibly could. So, Lord, would you do that in our lives? Would you give us strength and courage, hope and love and all that we need? We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said,